it's in your interest to prioritize, to have a, a more austere, more secure capability that will give you power and independence. Right. Always know what phase of your life you're in and think about what the next 10 years will be like for you and for those you care more about. Would you be in a position to try to redefine capitalism? Yes. Welcome to this year's special collaboration between Endgame and the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. The theme of this year's festival is past, present, and future. This year's guest is American investor and author of Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order, Ray Dalio. The aim of this discussion is to explore and reconcile the idealism versus the realism of the future world. Enjoy this episode. Hi, Ray. Thank you so much for gracing Hi. our podcast. Ah, it's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I, I know you've, uh, you've written so many successful books, uh, and we in Southeast Asia are, are very keen on, on a number of things that you could you know, shed wisdom upon uh, all of us in Southeast Asia. But I, I want to explore a little bit about what, what values that you were brought up with uh, that made you the, the famous Ray Dalio that I think can, can share a lot of wisdom to the rest of the world? Well, I was lucky to have uh, two parents who loved me. My dad was a jazz musician. My mom was a, sort of a stay-at-home mom. And, um, and um, I don't know why, but I got into doing work, uh, work uh, such as delivering newspapers and so on as a, as a kid and earning the money. And then when I was um, 12, I was caddying and the stock market was hot. And so I got, um, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I got involved in the stock market. I remember the first stock I bought, which was uh, the only company that I ever heard of that was selling for less than $5 a share. And I figured, well, if it's less than $5 a year, I can buy more shares. So if it goes up, I'll make more money, which was a stupid idea. But what happened is I got lucky. Uh, a company came along and acquired this company that was about to go bankrupt and it tripled. And I thought this game is easy. The game is not easy, but I, I got hooked on the game. That had an effect, but um, mostly, um, um, I would say having good parents, my dad was a hardworking, you know, the classic, uh, he went through the depression and the war um, and was a jazz musician and play, uh, hardworking, but uh, also creative, not a highly structured guy. My mom loved me a lot. I didn't like school. Uh, that was a frustration for them. But anyway, uh, that was kind of the background um, I grew up in also an era of almost unbounded optimism. Kennedy was president. The United States wanted to go to the moon, eliminate poverty, all of those things, believing I could almost do anything. And I came out to a world of equal opportunity. So I was, I didn't like high school. I, I got into a um, a college that worked very well for me, but not a, uh, a great college in classic measurements on probation. I, I loved college, did very well, went on to Harvard Business School, um, which I loved. Um, and I was in that world of equal opportunity. So that's kind of the summary. You, you've you talked a lot about those in, in your principles book, but I'm just curious as to whether or not you would have turned out the way you are if you had been born 
in a different time in a different country. I mean, you've, you're, you're the true manifestation of the American dream, right? But would, would we yes. be able to see the same Ray Dalio if Ray would have been born at a different time or in a different country? Um, I think that advers- if, if you look at immigrants, it depends on what I was like. Yeah. Um, it depends how, in what ways it was different. But when I look at, uh, when I look at immigrants and their, how they get around their obstacles and they're not having much and they have to survive and find the way, I think that that builds strengths and that those strengths and aspirations in combination drive you to what your passions are. And I think I, when you asked that question, I think I would have had a greater chance of that than if I was born into a rich family. If I was born into a rich family in right. the United States and I had lots of privileges, I suspect I wouldn't have had the same drive, I, I was, you know, strive to make, you know, uh, learned how to make, make money by working at an early age. If I didn't have those kinds of things, I think that would have caused me to be a bigger, uh, different type of person, a more different type of person than um, if I went to another country. Interesting. I, I want to talk about the current generation and compare that with your generation. You were born in the late 40s. You've, you've talked a lot about how important it is to spend less than you make. We're sort of like living in an era where I think the current generation or the young generation is having a tough time in deferring gratification. What, what sort of advice would you have for the current generation or the young generation? There's, there's this notion that, you know, there's this high time preference. There's not a whole lot of sense for low time preference. They want to get this instant gratification today and not want to defer gratification until the future date. Well, uh, I mean, I'm just going to tell you how reality works. Yeah. There are things that really, really matter. And there are things that don't matter a lot in your priorities. Um, if you keep indulging yourself to consume and don't build savings, you're spending on luxuries now in exchange for a great pain later. Well, um, uh, you have to be self-sufficient plus. I don't care whether you, that's at a high level of income and a high level of spending or a low level of income or a low level of spending. That's an individual choice of what kind of life they want to live. But if you're not earning more than you are spending, you will be dependent on others and you will be vulnerable and experience a terrible time when uh, when you can't get ahead of that money. But so first, I mean, if, if, if you spend more than you earn and you borrow money to do it, who, when you pay back, that's going to be bad. If you still, even if you spend more than you earn because somebody gives it to you, you're going to be dependent on them giving it to you. The only way that you're going to get freedom and healthy is by um, earning more than you spend and building that. I used to calculate at first how many days, weeks, months, and years could I live if money didn't come in. Wow. And I would, and I'd feel good. The only time I felt security is when I could live for an extended period of time. That gave me a sense of having both freedom and security. So don't waste it. Like I, I, 
I give um, my kids and, I, and, I, and my grandkids sometimes uh, gifts, but I give them a gold coin hmm. um, a, a, as a gift. And then I'll give them some other little gift, you know, maybe a toy or something. Um, and, I, and I told them, you're never to spend that coin in, uh, through your life unless there's a real emergency. And hopefully through your life, you'll never have a, a need for spending that coin. Uh, those coins that you're accumulating. And when you get an income, you put a, a gold coin, you buy another gold <laughs> coin, and you give it to your children, and you pass it along. And the day will come where you're going to have that. And and what they're experiencing this, the children and the grandchildren, is that they're developing a treasure. Most of the other stuff is junk. You know, they buy something, it's, you know, a year or two or whatever, it's gone. So I'm saying that it's in, it's in your interest right. to prioritize, to have a, a more austere, more secure capability that will give you power and independence. How, how more difficult is it to, to get that sort of wisdom in a household? In a, in a world where you've, you've aptly pointed this out many times, in a world where values are diverging, wealth is diverging in a, in a, at a bigger rate than we might have ever seen you know, in the past, in the last few decades. And, and how, how does social media affect the ability or the inability to share that sort of wisdom for you to save for the future? Well, every, uh, there's a number of things that um, come to mind in response to your question. Um, everybody will learn through their experiences. Right. When you, when you learn through your mind and you're taught things, it's intellectual learning it's not it's not going to stay with you you need visceral learning through your experiences so we'll all learn through experiences then we have um a problem in what do different people learn in their environments and we're, we're talking about that because like i say if if i didn't have an environment that taught me the things i taught like you know the need to work hard, right. it's, the, all of that, I wouldn't have learned it. People, and so with large wealth gaps, one of the real problems of the situation that has always been through all cycles a problem is that as um, one earns a lot of money uh, or enough money, then they take care of their children in a privileged way in a, you know, and whatever, and the children may not have to uh, aspire. And so you see that rich people uh, sort of get unfair advantages and they are um, also not um, getting some of those strengths. And you see the poor people, I see this a lot. We, we work, my wife and I, but particularly my wife, works right. in the poorest school districts in, in Connecticut where there's poverty um, and um, all sorts of terrible type of environments. And in that environment, they learn differently because uh, there's drugs, there's crime, there's gangs, there's a problem in the school systems of being educated well. Um, we live in Greenwich, Connecticut. The average, um, the average amount spent per student in the high school, this is a few years ago, so it's not up to date, but um, it was 24000 In Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a poor school district, right up the road, it's $14,000 a student. So there's less money being put into that right. school district. They need more because also basics like they don't have computers in, in 
when we had COVID, they're supposed to learn on computers, but 60,000 students right. in, in Connecticut did not have computers because the families couldn't afford computers. They didn't have it part of their education system. And the society would not provide that. We did. We bought those computers philanthropically to, to give them to that. And when you have environments in which that is the environment, then you learn ga- your, your community is your gangs, literally. Your right. income is dealing drugs. Um, and, you know, your path is crime. That causes incarceration. That causes, that's enormously expensive. In the state of Connecticut, it's like $700 million a year because of that type of cycle. And so they learn different things. That's just the mechanics of what we're dealing with. And unless we somehow as a society recognize that um, broad-based, you, 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 you can't have a living standard below which people can't go. They deserve what right. I had, which is ideally two parents, at least one parent. Some cases they don't have that, but they need the support to get through a public school that's decent and come out to a land of equal opportunity. So you, so the society must do that, or it will implode. It will collapse as homelessness, mental illness, drugs, and everything increasingly shift things, as we're seeing take place now, and. Um, so, so yes, you're going, everyone will have the different experiences. So somebody's got to rise above that. We'll have a war, an internal civil war, um, if we uh, don't do that. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of where we are. And so if you see the cycles through history, that's what always happens. The capitalist gets, um, the, you know, there's capitalism and Communism, redistribute the wealth, keep the wealth, unfair advantages. How do you do that in a way that is uh, healthy for the most majority of uh, the people so they have good experiences? That's the issue of our time. Special thanks to this episode's sponsor, Luang. Find out how you too can navigate big changes and open up a lane of opportunities for Indonesian society by clicking the link in the description below. Would you be in a position to try to redefine capitalism? Yes. Um, first of all, let's agree that it uh, has to work for the majority of people. Right. Um, most people. You know, it's got to work for 70 percent, at least of the economy. I mean, most. And let's right. establish the fact that there's a level below which we shouldn't let people go. And let's also establish that that the society as a whole has to be productive. That it's not just giving people money. So if if you keep giving people money, you, you, that's not going to be good. We talked about that. You have to build a healthy education system and convert that into productivity. Productivity is a key word. You have right. to society as a whole has to be productive to be able to then have the income because it's not just financial income. Money just it has no intrinsic value. It's what you produce. It's got to produce. So you have to be productive as a whole. You, almost everybody's got to aspire to be self-sufficient plus, and you have to help them get there in order to operate. So if we all agree on that, there are wonderful things that we can do to help that. Invest and aspire to equal quality education or high. Don't lower the high levels to get equality, uh, whatever. Aspire on how to raise the educational and security levels you know, in many schools right now, there's um, you have to go through a metal detector to for, to make sure guns don't go into the schools. You have drugs. You have all of those things. You have to uh, get control, create an environment in which those children are raised well, have those basics, educated well, made them productive. 
we have found out um, my, my wife through her work for her, her mission is to get um, high school right. students in the worst neighborhoods who would have dropped out through high school and into jobs. We find that that can be done for about $450 a student. Wow. Um, and, and so if you do that, you realize that's cost effective, but it doesn't have to be our program, but in one way or another, um, we have to define it. We have to define capitalism as also having all in cost. What I mean all in cost is that there are costs to educating, to not educating a student, having them drop out in, and crime and so on. Or there are costs in our environment. If somebody can pollute the environment, and there's not a penalty for polluting the environment, but it's a cost to the society. In one way or another, for capitalism and the profit system to work, it has to be all in cost. But we also have to recognize that the profit system alone, it's a great way of allocating resources right. by and large, because it means that whatever you're producing is worth more than whatever it costs you to produce it. That's that's a good thing to have that. Right. But we also have to realize that it can divert resources up from those things that we need most, so like education. Like, for example, the Constitution in the United States makes education a state issue, not a federal issue. And then within each state, it's typically a tax district issue. So if you live in a rich community, you're probably going to get more money for education than not, and, and then your kids will be more privileged. Nothing wrong with educating those kids well, but in some way you've got to make it um, work and engineer. And I see it in my philanthropy. Mm. I see it, I mean, for example, okay, here it is, um, we're here, and COVID comes along, and the right. kids don't have computers. Okay, so th there has to be, on these basics, an understanding that you need to invest in the people and their productivities, and there's intolerable things that can't be done in, uh, or not be done or done in a bad way. And you can design that. You can design yeah. the way to design that, by the way, is not by any one person imposing what they want. We have a right. problem here of uh, polarization and all different people have all different views of what they want. And, and now they have extreme views of what they want and they fight and they don't resolve it. I think what we need um, as a country um, is bipartisanship. Yep of moderates who are intelligent and able to do the engineering. Like we should have a, a bipartisan president, I think. Right. Um, this is a dream, but there are things we can do. Uh, um, who has a bipartisan cabinet who brings together both sides um, there, moderates, who agree more with each other than agree with the extremists, right. and then who are smart enough, and they should have something like a Manhattan Project or a Constitutional Convention in which there's something like a year, and you bring them from the moderate left and the moderate right, but that who can work together and engineer um, a proper re-engineering, ref, uh, or reforming, of capitalism, how it works mechanically, and you can you 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 can get there. Everything needs to be reformed. Every machine, every computer, every thing, every society needs to be reformed. And we need to have we need to reform the system so that it achieves those goals of working well for most people and making them productive. And that can be done. Right. I I am I'm completely I'm I'm in complete agreement with you on the polarization. It's it's quite pervasive. It's not just in the U.S. 
it's all across the world right and and i'm i'm totally with you in this idealism of creating some sort of a bipartisan framework of decision making right but but what i'm what i'm detecting beneath that is that there is a concern with respect to the inability to find the right intersection between power and talent irrespective of the ideology whether it's an autocracy or a democracy right i studied the 10 most powerful empires over the last 500 years and the last three reserve currencies it took me through the rise and decline of the dutch empire and the gilder the british empire and the pound the rise and early decline in the united states empire and the dollar and the decline and rise of the Chinese empire and its currencies, as well as the rise and decline of the Spanish, German, French, Indian, Japanese, Russian, and Ottoman empires, along with their significant conflicts, as measured in this chart. To understand China's patterns better, I also studied the rise and fall of Chinese dynasties and their monies back to the year 600. Because looking at all these measures at once can be confusing, I'll focus on the four most important ones, the Dutch, British, US, and Chinese. You'll quickly notice the pattern. Now let's simplify the form a bit. As you can see, they transpired in overlapping cycles that lasted about 250 years, with 10 to 20 year transition periods between them. Typically, these transitions have been periods of great conflict because leading powers don't decline without a fight. So how am I measuring an empire's power? In this study, I used eight metrics. Each country's measure of total power is derived by averaging them together. They are education, inventiveness and technology development, competitiveness in global markets, economic output, share of world trade, military strength, the power of their financial center for capital markets, and the strength of their currency as a reserve currency. Because these powers are measurable, we can see how strong each country is now, was in the past, and whether they're rising or declining. By examining the sequences from many countries, we can see how a typical cycle transpires. And because the wiggles can be confusing, we can simplify it a bit to focus on the pattern of cause-effect relationships that drive the rise and decline of a typical empire. As you can see, better education typically leads to increased innovation and technology development, and with a lag, the establishment of the currency as a reserve currency. You can also see that these forces then declined in a similar order, reinforcing each other's decline. Let's now look at the typical sequence of events going on inside a country that produces these rises and declines. In a nutshell, the big cycle typically begins after a major conflict, often a war, establishes the new leading power and the new world order. Because no one wants to challenge this power, a period of peace and prosperity typically follows. As people get used to this peace and prosperity, they increasingly bet on it continuing. They borrow money to do that, which eventually leads to a financial bubble. The empire's share of trade grows, and when most transactions are conducted in its currency, it becomes a reserve currency, which leads to even more borrowing. At the same time, this increased prosperity distributes wealth unevenly, so the wealth gap typically grows between the rich haves and the poor have-nots. Eventually, the financial bubble bursts, which leads to the printing of money, an increased internal conflict between the rich and the poor, which leads to some form of revolution to redistribute wealth. This can happen peacefully, or as a civil war. While the empire struggles with this internal conflict, its power diminishes relative to external rival powers on the rise. 
When a new rising power gets strong enough to compete with the dominant power that is having domestic breakdowns, external conflicts, most typically wars, take place. Out of these internal and external wars come new winners and losers. Then the winners get together to create the new world order. And the cycle begins again. And so um, if we're realistic, we understand that dynamic and how that works, because that dynamic has happened repeatedly through history. So you have to get to the notion, OK, what does it matter most? Who is we? Who mm. is in control? Can't be theoretical. So I think that we, as a population, uh, will go toward a form of financial crisis, system, civil war, and external war um, if we um, don't have fear of that. I have a principle. If you worry, you right. don't have to worry. And if you don't worry, yeah. you need to worry. Because if you worry, you will take care of what you're worrying about, and it's chances of happening are reduced. And if you don't worry, you'll headlong, headlong into it. I think we're not worrying enough about these things. Mm -hmm. And only if we recognize that we have to pull together um, and that there's a strong middle, there needs to be a strong middle, and we pull together, and we're not so hung up on exactly how we do it, just as long as let's agree on how to do it. And, and and work there, that we can do it. And there's no other path. I, I sense that the world is not worried enough, right? And, and what would it take for anybody across the world to be more worried in the context of the five forces that you've been talking about, right? The, the indebtedness, internal conflicts, external conflicts, climate change and technological change and all that. It, it just seems that nobody's worried enough about any of these. It's because we've never experienced it before in our lives. And what's happening now is one of those things that comes along once every 75, 100 years kind of thing. Um, and, um, and, and we only react to it. So we each go into our, our happy worlds. Uh, think of our experience. You go into your neighborhood. We, um, you know, we... I don't know, go out to dinner, go um, um, to ball games. We, right. they watch their streaming this and, and whatever, and there's not the experience. And it seems so, why worry about it? it? I mean, like everybody's talking about it, but I'm not experiencing it. The only way we learn is through experiences and sometimes the pain that they produce. And so, we haven't had this. It comes along once. Uh, the, the new world order began after the last great fight, the war. Right. Okay. You have the foot war. You have the pain of the war. You have the restructuring. You establish who the power is. Nobody wants war again. You mm -hmm. take that depression, that generation, my parents' generation, who lived through depression and war and they come out and they have learned. Okay. They have learned to save. They have learned to, you know, not get into war and that learning and that establishing who's in control sets the stage for the prosperity that comes that then we produce these greater wealth gaps, um, senses of unf unfairness, debt bubbles, and we do the same thing again. You have a debt bubble crisis and so on. So there's only, if, 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 if you can get them to intellectually worry, I and mean, that's one of the things right. I'm trying to pass this, this thought along. Yeah. If you're worrying, you pass that along, but sometimes it's going to take experiences and then it's going to take figuring out how yeah. to engineer it so that you get through it. So you have to have agreement by smart, reasonable period people about what to do. That's just how reality works. You know, Bridgewater has done excellently over the past few decades. I, I would think, I would speculate that it's mainly because you've been the great chief worry officer of Bridgewater. 
Now, <laughs> would, would, it, would, would it help? I mean, would you advise anybody out there, be it in a household, in a school, in an office, in any social institution, as for them to have some sort of a chief worry officer so that the world will be better off going forward? Uh, I don't know. I, I think um, I think the world is worry and opportunity, and then knowing how to go after the worry, excuse me, go after the um, opportunity while um, minimizing the downside. I, and I learned how to do that through my experience as a painful, painful experience. Right. Um, and if you want, I could tell you about it. But anyway, through this painful experience of being painfully wrong, I learned humility. And I wanted to find the smartest people who would disagree with me to, to stress test me and also for me to learn. And I also learned how diversification of my bets could reduce my risk by up to 80, 80% without reducing my returns. So um, I think. People have got to learn those things. They have to learn how they can have great upside um, with opportunity while um, eliminating, virtually eliminating the uh, unacceptable downside. So there's an, you have to learn that through experiences and so on. Uh, I think experience is the best teacher. My dad, Learned it because he went through depression and war. He didn't earn much money. He was a jazz musician. He um, um, he raised me. I went to a great school. He had everything that he needed. He had, had um, we uh, we had everything we needed. A nice house, um, not a mansion, of course, but a nice house, food. I went to public school. We had car, um, uh, it, everything that he needed, and um. When he died and he was 91, wow. um, he had over a million dollars saved up when, and, and that's a while ago. So that's a few million dollars. And he had a great life and he learned it because you can do that. You have to, you know, give up overindulgence, let's call it. And, 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 and you do that. Um, so in each in our own ways, we can learn it through perhaps through experiment, of course, we want to do it intellectually, but so I don't know that, you know, like the real question is, is the person in charge like that? You mm -hmm. have a chief worry officer, it's good. Yeah, but companies have risk officers, it's a good thing. Surface those risks because, and also know that it's only the one, you know, one in 20 years or one in 30 years that'll kill you. Like all companies die. Well, when I decided that I was going to run Bridgewater, I did certain things to make sure that it couldn't die because it can yeah. contract because, um, but we would not go broke. And so, yes, that worrying is, is good. I don't know about it, but you have to have it in your bones and in the leadership while you're yeah. also excited about the opportunities. Because yeah. look at, I mean, Bridgewater was amazing. Two bedroom apartment, 1,500 people. We made more money for clients than any um, hedge fund ever in existence. They made money. We made money. Um, we have a community. It, it's built around meaningful work and meaningful relationships. It was. It was. It was great. But there is, a, you know, there's a way of doing that balancing, and you have to know it and want it through experiences. I think. Yeah, you've 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 done really well, man. I mean, you've made money in what twenty eight out of the last thirty years, or something like that. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't want to lose money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I we've made great money. And um, yeah, we made more money for their investors than any other. So yeah, you're you're one of the earliest observers of china you've you've done business there you've interacted with so many personali personalities out there i, I want to talk about the current u.s china relations uh, and and i want to put this in the context of what you've alluded to you know a few times in the context of the 100 you know year storm in the horizon talk about that um yeah i've been very lucky i um 19, 
84, I was invited over by Citic, which was called a window company. It was the only company that was allowed to deal with the outside world. 1978, Deng Xiaoping came to power and he wanted to have open door policy and great reforms. And I went there and I went there for curiosity. They didn't have any money. They couldn't pay me anything, advice. And I went there for curiosity. And I started to develop these wonderful relationships with these wonderful people about helping them develop their system, their, uh, you know, their com- capitalism and so on for long. Yeah. And we've been long, old friends over a long period of time. It was something like 12 or 15 years I was there before I ever earned any money. And it was the satisfaction of of that relationship. So, and I'm, and I'm, and that's continued to today. Um, I studied the dynasties um, and I've had the experiences since I started going, China's per capita income has increased by 28 times. Life expectancies increased by 10 years on average. A poverty rate went from 88% to less than 1%. I'm an amazing, the greatest right. economic transformation of all time. And uh, and there's a great understanding of history, and that's uh, why um, Xi Jinping says um, that there's a great storm on the horizon, a one in a hundred year storm on the horizon, um, and that storm that we're facing, um, that we're facing, we're all facing it in the world. In the United States, we're talking about. It, the same cycle I talked about with combination of debt, wealth gaps, pro, this international conflict. Okay, that storm, there's a great storm on the horizon. And then there's um, the reactions of how do you deal with that great storm? Um, there's internal conflict, there's external conflict. So what's happening in China now is largely um, what always happens in such periods of great conflict, and and they know it, they've seen it through their dynasties, um, that everybody must line up and be, and there's no room for fighting between ourselves. There's one right. side, and everybody must line up and be on that side. Um, and And if there's any wavering, you know, okay, off with your head or, you know, something like you're, you're not, You know, you have to deal with that. That's something, by the way, we're dealing with in the United States and democracies and in their own ways in history. You have to look at history. And when you go through those periods, even the most democratic countries, you could not be, cannot say a lot of things. You can't do anything. You have to follow, line up and follow. And so we're doing that while there is then these classic things we're fighting over. So, for example, in World War II, when we had the world depression, then the uh, conflict, let's say in Japan, by way of example, it happened with Germany and Europe, Japan in Asia. Um, there, there's this conflict, the geopolitical conflict. In the geopolitical conflict, the United States uh, cuts off uh, oil to China, uh, to Japan and also freeze it, freeze their assets. And when they freeze their assets, um, and that, that leads to Pearl Harbor. Um, the, the same dynamic is going on. Uh, chips are now oil. Yep. And uh, so that's the dynamic. There's a fear uh, in, in China and other countries that they might get sanctioned by the United States, meaning just like for the, if you had dollar assets um, in Japan in the world or Russia, you uh, those that they make them worthless. Uh, that particular dynamic is is sort of happening again, and so that's where we are. We have a number of issues that are irreconcilable differences. So we're at the red lines of a number of those issues. Um, I could touch on them briefly, but there's obviously the Taiwan issue. Uh, go to the history of Taiwan. Um, okay, we're going to go back. Um, there's what's called the hundred years of humiliation. 
Um, the war, they lived, the, the West and uh, China lived in two largely different worlds that then came together when the uh, foreign powers, particularly let the British come right. and um, into China. And uh, they want to trade. And China says it has all its needs, doesn't want to trade, but they, they want to force themselves in. They create the opium wars. This is now starting in 1840. Um, and they create the opium uh, wars to sell opium to get that, that and whatever. And, and then they have military conflict and different foreign powers take different parts of China. Japan takes uh, Taiwan in 1895. Fast forward, you go to um, the end of World War II. Japan lo loses the war. The new powers who win to find who gets what territories. Uh, China uh, is given back uh, Taiwan. Um, and so everybody agrees uh, Taiwan is now reincorporated into China. But China has a civil war between, again, the left and the right, the communists and the, and the capitalists. You have this war. The uh, capitalists run to Taiwan. And so there's an argument of who controls Taiwan, but there's one China and it's an internal civil war. 50 years later, uh, or, or excuse me, 50 years ago, Henry Kissinger goes and everybody agrees China's part of Taiwan. Okay, now we have the possibility, there's a question, supposed to be peaceful reunification. Um, over time. It's 50 years later, and it would be considered a declaration of war if the United Sa States said that Taiwan would be an independent country. That would be intolerable. But there's uh, the pushing of the edge of that, which means um, that there's um, in favor of the defense of Taiwan, uh, the United States will act in favor of the defense of Taiwan, send military equipments and so on. And so that's one example of something that is, you know, like right at the edge and is kind of an uncompromisable and difficult situation. If you take a number of the issues, like um, if I take um, the issue of uh, support for Russia right. in, the, in the war here, it's 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 a big issue. If I take ch trip chips, if I take trade, if I take many things, we are at those lines, and therefore we have this great power conflict. Wow, you know, in the seeming Thucydides trap between China and the U.S., uh, what what would be your views with respect to Southeast Asia? Right. Uh, do you think this is more of a threat or an opportunity for Southeast Asia? Before I answer the Southeast Asia, I want to emphasize that that struggle, there will not be a winner or a loser in that struggle, right. but the ultimate winner, there, there's going to be that conflict, will all depend on how strong the country is internally. Got it. It will depend on financially how it's strong, productivity, mm. how it's strong, and how people deal with each other internally to be strong. So both of those countries are going to struggle with each other, and but their main struggle is an internal strength struggle. And that will determine how the external conflict goes, right? And to answer your question, it's an opportunity more than a risk. But um, I'll give you the history. Right. Neutral countries in wars, there's winners, there's losers, and there's neutral countries. Neutral countries do better than the winning countries in wars right. because the winning countries get into debt like the british won the, the war but they were bankrupt 
Um, the United States made a lot of money because it entered the wars late. So all the gold that it accumulated, gold was money at the time. The world, right. the United States accumulated 80% of the world's gold um, because it entered both World War I and World War II late. Um, so neutral countries that don't get into war, the three big ingredients for a country are, do you earn more than you spend? So you have a good income statement and balance sheet. Do you have an internal dynamic that is destructive or productive? And are you in an international war? And so when I look at the immersion, the emergence of countries, countries in the ASEAN region of right. the, the nature of how Indonesia, uh, 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 Vietnam, Philippines, other of those countries, they're coming up to have higher rates of capital formation. Right. They are operating in a way that's going to be more and more productive. Um, they are, um, if, they, if they remain largely neutral and can avoid being in that war, and that they will do well. Singapore is emerging as um, a almost Switzerland kind of capital yep. for that for various reasons. And so that is an area of opportunity. Um, India also benefits from this as um, because you also see that as companies don't want to be in China uh, because of the nature of the, the whole war situation, not just military war, but let's say economic war, and they're worried about that, then they go to countries, these other countries, and they then they benefit. Capital goes, business opportunities go, and so on. That's also, by the way, happening in the Gulf countries in the Middle East to some extent. So uh, it is by and large um, a benefit if those three ingredients remain in place. Those mm -hmm. three ingredients are, you know, earn earn more than you spend, have a good income statement and balance sheet, work well together. Yeah. So don't, you know, eliminate corruption um, or minimize it, create the capital formation, create mm -hmm. opportunity. And then number three is don't get in the war. That's great advice. I'm, I'm going to push on this, Ray. In, in the context of the need to spend less than you make, the need to borrow less than you make, the need to be more productive than you make, between China and the U.S., who's, who's likely to be more competitive in the next few decades in the context of all those? The United States um, has a very, very unstructured um, creativity that also which with its capital markets and its adaptability is able to uh, invent uh, very quickly. Um, uh, it doesn't make a strategic plan. It doesn't have the, um, you know, it's very much a bottom up. Uh, type of um, approach that also does create the problems that we're talking about, about the large wealth and opportunity gaps and those types of things. And um, when, um, you know, Plato, this, this, this mm -hmm. dynamic, this question has gone back a long time. Democracies existed a long time. Plato wrote the Republic and he made the point that there are cycles and, and what happens is the greatest risk to a democracy is anarchy due to the internal uh, fighting, creating the disruption and so on. So it has the, the United States has those advantages and has that challenge about that internal fighting and, and how that works and gets through it. Then you go to uh, China. And um, it now um, is dealing in a much more autocratic, top-down, directed uh, kind of way. That is um, uh, that, and um, uh, so uh, that will direct resources 
in many cases, to producing, like in a war economy, producing the things that are going to be needed. In other words, uh, in many cases, how, do you, how does a war economy work? You don't have a free market operating that economy as much as you, because the profit system, you know, people going and spending a lot of money on expensive handbags are not going to be productive in a war economy. It's just not going to work. So you have that sort of directed, but that directed um, is less going to be less corrected, but it's going to be very focused and you won't have people fighting each other in the same way as long as you keep that. And so you see um, that kind of um, an approach. Um, those are the differences in the approach. Both, both, both of them have their vulnerabilities. Uh, and so as we go through that, I think it, one, one can't easily say one side's going to win over the other side. Um, each has their vo- vulnerabilities, each has, you know, th- their, um, their advantages. So um, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce it. It's all a function of your circumstances. There comes a time where, you know, everybody lining up, doing what they're told, um, you know, go fight the war and, and all that is an advantage. And there are times where um, that kind of thing is a disadvantage because, you know, a top-down leadership uh, and all the decisions have got to go to leader and everybody's feared, fearful, and they won't make, because they're fearful, they won't make decisions and that has problems. So it it looks like that to me. To me. Um, I don't think we should worry about, you know, like pronouncing a winner. We just have to know that w- there's going to be a conflict along those lines as there always has been. Got it. Got it. Uh, Ray, one, one of the five great forces you've alluded to earlier is climate change, right? And, and I've, I've been alluding to the fact that, you know, the sustainability narrative resonates to only a small portion of the world population, whereas most of the world population is more concerned about putting food on the table, irrespective of how the energy is sourced, right? How do you, in your view, how do you think we could help reconcile these two seemingly irreconcilable narratives, the narrative of development and the narrative of sustainability? I, I don't know that I have the answers for all, all the world's <laughs> problems. Um, uh, I, 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 so let me just describe what I think is the reality of what is going on. Um, we have a situation where, as you point out, and I, my, my, one of the five great forces throughout history has been acts right. of nature. Droughts, floods, and pandemics have killed more people than wars, uh, calling, caused more uh, governments and geopolitical systems to collapse, and so on. And it's a huge deal right now, uh, at, however you deal with it. If you don't deal with it, it's a huge deal. If you deal with it, it's a huge deal. It's going to be costly. There are three types of uh, costs for that. Uh, There's the cost of going from, uh, let's call it brown energy to green energy, uh, Mm -hmm. which is very costly. You have to invent the energy. You have to readapt. um, And in there, that period of time, there's a gap of not investing in the brown energy. Um, And so there's a supply demand issue and it becomes costly. The second uh, cost is the building of infrastructure to deal with climate change. Uh, Literally, you know, in in Indonesia, it's an issue of, you know, Jakarta and and two other. um, So you have to build infrastructure. How do you deal with the infrastructure? That's costly. And then there will certainly be damages, droughts, floods, all of those will have damages. And the estimated cost of these things, in one way or another, however you spend it, is in, is in the vicinity of $10 trillion a year, depending on how you do it. Let's call it 5 to $10 trillion a year. Right. 
world GDP is a hundred trillion dollars a year. So it's five to ten percent of GDP is going to be this cost that is going to come on top of the other costs. Okay, so okay, let's first realize that. Let's digest that. How are we going to deal with that? Then, as you point out, um, there's the uh, developed world and there's the emerging world. And the emerging world has a larger population and is poor. And in many cases, not efficient. There are many countries which are corrupt and so on. So how do you get resources or affect change, you know, in the uh, underdeveloped world? First, where does the money come from? Where's the motivation come from? How do you get through the corruption and so on? Well, there are no easy answers to these things, right? right. Um, right. The only answer um, of all of this is when the greater good yeah. is uh rises above above the individual good as the priority and then it becomes a common problem so how do you get the resources and so on yeah uh you know during such times uh the opposite is true you know i'm gonna fight for me and i'll we'll line up and we will fight for us so I think it's I, th- I think it's going to be an intractable problem. Claudia, I'm going to be interviewing Ray Dalio next week. I know you're a big fan of his. Any question you want me to ask him? Yeah, wow. Um, and I, I really like Ray Dalio. I'm a huge fan. Um, yeah, I actually I do. Um, I'm thinking, what would Ray Dalio tell? my five-year-old daughter, if I had one, right? About the next 10 to 20 years of her life, what should she expect? What should she think about? I'll, I'll question that. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Very excited for your time with Ray Dalio. Thank Tell you. Tell me how it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. What, what would Ray Dalio advise to a 10-year-old kid anywhere in the world, in terms of he or she needs to push forward in the future? I'm going to give you again the longer answer. Um, there are three phases in life, I think. There's the phase, the first phase in life, where you're dependent on others, you're being raised, you're going to school, right. and at 10 years old, um, you haven't yet transpired into puberty, it's just prior, just part of puberty. Um, and you're learning in a, in a unique way that changes actually at the mind brain changes uh, out of puberty in a way that you're having experiential learning. You, you haven't yet had the rebellion for your parents and so on. And so, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful time for this experiential learning um, by the way, almost every successful, really successful person I know uh, at that in that age, right around 10 or 12, uh, they got hooked on something and they liked it. And so that's experience. So at, at 10 or 12, have the experiences, follow your passions um, and, and enjoy that. Then there's going to be a transition um into where you're gaining independence your own thought and but you're still dependent until you get out in uh life when you're out from under your parents you you graduate school you're on now you're on your own now you're not dependent on others you have to make your decisions you make your choices you have a lot of free choices and then you begin a new phase of your life where Others become dependent on you. You try to become successful. You you have your family, you have your job, and you go through that dynamic. 
So at each level, at each age, I would give a different view. For the 10 year old, it's like, you know, go experience, imbue it. If, if you're mm-hmm. learning a language, it's shown that prior to puberty, you will learn that language without an accent. Um, at post puberty, you're going to learn it with an accent. So to have that experience to play, to enjoy, and so mm-hmm. on. Um, I'm, I, and I'd say, do that, uh, do your, expi- and then recognize if you can step back and say, I'm now going through the next phase and I'm in the next phase. Always know what phase of your life you're in and think about what the next 10 years will be like for you and for those you care more about. So like, for example, I'm 74 years old. Mm -hmm. I know where I am in my life. I know what the next 10 years will, um, where I'm likely to be, what that's going to be like and how I'll be different in 10 years from now. If I look at um, the people I love, I know what that'll be like. And they'll be younger or older. And if I think about, you know, the next generation, what will they be like if you're raising children and you're in your middle of your life and you're raising children? Imagine what they will go through over the next 10 years and where they're going to be. And if you can understand how life works, I mean, it's it's kind of like yeah. in most ways, we the life arc is pretty similar at certain yeah. ages. You know, you get married, you have kids, <laughs> things happen in a certain way. If you know what that art life arc is like, uh, you know, that would be a big thing. I, yeah. I would say one other thing and advice I give to everybody. And I, w- I would give it to the 10 year old because the 10 year old, it's the age that it begins to be a thing. Uh, uh, meditate. I've learned, yeah. um, I was very, very lucky um, in you know, when I was uh, in college years, 1969, um, to um, learn to meditate. The Beatles went to India. Mm-hmm. They came back and I learned to meditate. <laughs> Transcendental meditation helps to give you an equanimity and a perspective to almost rise above yourself, to understand how reality works. It gives you a centeredness and it gives you also a creativity because you transcend into your subconscious where a lot of creativity motion is. If you can meditate, it will help you see where you are in your life cycle. It'll help you understand and accept how reality works and help you develop your principles for dealing with reality to be effective. That's that's a great and long advice for a ten year old. <laughs> the, the the final question, Ray. What what makes Ray Dalio happy? I feel uh, there's there's many things that bring me a lot of lots of joy, and I uh, I, I, I like um, evolving fast, learning fast, and uh, and then contributing to evolution. So I lo- I want to evolve fast, and I want to contribute to evolution. So evolving and 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 contributing to evolution as is a general theme. However, um, I love um, like my the thing that makes me happiest now is probably my grandkids. I I, I you know I they're fabulous. So I have my passions, my intellectual passions. I have a compelling desire to pass along what I've learned and also my wealth of philanthropy and so on. I have, so how do I pass it along? Well, how do I learn? Well, um, and, and then how do I save her life? This is, I have to, I want to save her life. I, I, I love the philanthropy. I also have a passion for ocean exploration. Um, I'm, I was a diver. I am a diver, active diver. And then I, I do ocean exploration. One of the excitements is right. I've created a, um, a foundation with that supports ocean exploration with a great ship. You can go online and see it. it's called Ocean X. It's an yep, initiative. I know. It's going to go to Indonesia and it's going yep. to Indonesia, by the way, has the greatest underwater bi- biodiversity in the world. It's Thank totally you. undiscovered. And I'm excited that we're going to work uh, with the Indonesian disco- um, um, government 
to make underwater discoveries so that they also can plan. Um, and um, so that kind of, that's a great passion. And when I get to see this underwater world, that's exciting. So those are my, my, my friends, my, you know, one of the advantages of um, uh, being old is you've got a lot of old friends, you know, friends have been friends for a long, long time. So I, I very much enjoy uh, my friends doing different things. Great. I like snowboarding. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. At 74, you're still snowboarding. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Not the same <laughs> way I did in the past. <laughs> anyway, I know you got to go, Ray. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you. And I hope to catch up with you. Take I look care. forward to it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the great Ray Dalio from Bridgewater. Thank you. Inilah Endgame. 